Thank you to our worship team this morning. That was great. That was really great, leading us in worship this morning. I thoroughly enjoyed that. I hope that we, as a community, can be first class worshipers of God, that it is fun, that we look forward to it, that it is the highlight of our week when we get to come to chapel and worship God and we get to hear about him and his word. You're going to hear a variety of different speakers in the chapel series. Uh, Ryan's been working hard putting that together. I hope that you love chapel. I hope it's great to come here. So I want to give you a little bit of free advice. Where I come from, most recently, the last 15 years, we lived in a little town, Morro Bay, California, and right next to it was Cayucas, California. Anybody ever been to Cayucas, California? Yeah, okay, there's a couple of hands. Beautiful location right on the beach. One of the wealthiest towns in uh, California, actually, because it's a small town, a lot of rich people live there. I was shocked just before we moved <laughs> to drive by and see a toilet with a free sign in Cayucas, <laughs> California. And so I'm gonna give you a little bit of free advice. Uh, I hope you take it. Unlike this, I was like, I'm not taking that toilet. <laughs> uh, that was just a, a thing that they do out there is they put free things out on the curb and they just disappear. People would take them. I don't know if anybody took the toilet. But here's my little bit of advice. And I'm gonna use this chair as a part of my illustration. When you sit in a chair, there's many different ways of sitting in a chair, right? Um, I, could, I could have my legs over the edge, you know, really relaxed and abusing the chair. But the first one that I want to talk about is the posture of leaning back. This is what I do on a Friday night, Saturday night. It's been a long week, and I am tired, and I am ready to kick back, take it easy, Turn on the TV, maybe stream a little Netflix, Disney Plus, you know, watch uh, another episode of Loki or, you know, Hamilton for the 15th time, uh, whatever your thing is. You know, it, it communicates to the world that I'm taking it easy. I want to be entertained. Don't make me work too hard. That's what that posture indicates. A second posture is I'm going to sit up straight. And this is the posture I assume you all took when you went to class just a little bit ago or later today or whenever you have your classes. And, you're like, and it communicates, I am here, I'm ready to listen, I'm ready to learn, I am ready to receive what you want me to receive. There's a third posture, which I love, and that is the lean in. This indicates I'm interested. You just piqued my interest. I'm curious. I want to know more. I might even have a question that I want to ask you. I might even be ready to sign up and say yes and do something. I'm leaning in. Those are three possible postures that you can take. And let me suggest that posture matters. It represents an attitude. It represents what you're thinking. It communicates to those around you and to yourself. It helps you kind of focus on uh, uh, what's your attitude here? And so my encourage to you, my advice, is to come to chapel as well as to class and to a job interview. This is good advice for many different places. Um, but in particular in this context, come to chapel sitting up and leaning in on occasion. But sit up, ready to hear, eager to see what God is going to teach you today. So I want you, want you to lean into the message that I believe God has given me for today. And... Remember back to your senior year in high school. For some of you, that was like, you know, a couple months ago. And others, like I, we probably have some faculty in the room, that was like decades ago. They might hardly even remember. What high school did I go to? I don't know. That was way back. Okay, so back in your senior year of high school, did you ever have someone ask you, hey, what are you doing after high school? You know, maybe it was an uncle, a teacher even, uh, maybe it's a friend. But, hey, what are you doing after high school? And you probably felt some pressure to sum it up in a short little sentence. Your entire life after high school in a short little sentence. I'm going to, whatever it might have been, I'm going to Stanford to study computer science. I'm going to KU uh, to study mathematics. I'm going to K-State to become a vet. What was it for you? Think about it just a second. We're going to do a little audience participation. Okay, in just a minute, I'm going to count to three, and I want us all just to say out loud, what was your short, pat answer that you gave? Uh, and it's simply going to be in that form, I'm going to blank to do whatever it is. 
One, two, three. I'm going to Tabor to study math and to play soccer. All right, all right, thank you. So, and for many people, when you said that, that's, that's all it took. They were satisfied. It's like, oh, you're going to Tabor. For me, that was my answer. I'm going to Tabor to study math. I'm thinking about being a high school math teacher, and I'm going to play soccer. They're like, oh, great, you're going to be great. Okay, the rest of your life, you're fine. You're awesome. You know, so there, at age 17, maybe 18, I have now summarized the rest of my life, and I know what I'm going to do, and everybody's happy with it. Now, you knew you were in trouble if you got this kind of, really? Like, you're going to spend the next three years playing video games and do nothing? No, I don't think so. Or are you going to go study that? Are there jobs in that? You know, maybe you got some of those questioning remarks. But so as you thought about this, I'm going to go do this and do that. Well, you're here. And let me suggest that the reason you're here, that's part of it. But that's not all of it by any means. I think there's something much much bigger of why you are here at Tabor College right now, today in this place, in this year. I believe it's much larger than that. I think it is. You're here to learn a new way of thinking and living. I want to share this verse with you. Maybe it's familiar for a lot of you. Romans 12, 2. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. I'd like to have you for the next few minutes think deeply about what does it mean to not conform to the ways, the pattern of this world. I believe there is a huge battle going on. Now, it's not this kind of a battle. It's not a, a physical battle, necessarily. Uh, I think this was taken. Michael, I hope it's okay. I stole your picture. Yeah, it was in the E! News. I thought it was fair game. And uh, I, I'm not sure. Um, who, who are the front two people? Well, do you see yourself in the picture? If you see yourself, raise your hand. Yeah, there we go. Okay, this is a great picture. Okay, this is a battle that was going on. But this, I believe there is a spiritual battle that is going on for your soul. And it is raging. You may not know it or realize it, but I believe there is a spiritual battle raging for who's going to be king of your heart. Who is going to be king of your soul? We talk about God's kingdom coming on earth as it is in heaven. I believe it starts right there in your soul. Who's king of my heart? So in that battle, the ways of the world, the patterns of this world, what that verse was talking about, we can see here, Proverbs 14, 12, the first part of it says, there is a way that appears to be right. And we've heard this. We hear this through media, through television, through video games even, through, sometimes through friends and parents and people that we know. And it communicates, hey, this is the way to go. For us in America, a lot of times it's the American dream. Work hard, get ahead, be comfortable. Okay, that's maybe the ways of this world. That's the focus. That's what you should focus on. There's other things. Be famous. Get lots of clicks, lots of likes. That's the goal. Be famous. Maybe be rich. Um, for some, maybe it's something like this. Fight for a cause. Choose a cause you believe in. The environment, climate change, it's a problem. We need to fix that. That's the cause. That's what life is all about, is, is fighting for that cause. But as you see in the rest of that verse, it leads to death. The ways of this world, the way that appears to be right, is empty, and it leads to death. It looks right, but it's not. That's this pattern of this world. And so this is what I'm inviting you into, is a new way of living. And some of you are already on that path, and you understand what I'm talking about, and I want to encourage you in that. Some of you haven't chosen that yet. Here you can see, I talked, for those of you that are new students, you heard me mention last week in, in the uh, opening move-in days, uh, a little bit about the narrow and the wide path. And we, we heard this, for the wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. When you look around in the world, most of the people that you see, they're taking this broad path. They've bought in to this ways of living that is not a biblical way of living. I hope you've already started to discover here at Tabor College, there's a lot of people here that have not bought into that. Instead, they said, I want to be on the narrow path, and I want to enter through the narrow gate. I want to tell you a quick story as an example here. So uh, very recently, I was at 
Cal Poly teaching software engineering, leading their software engineering program, and I taught the capstone. So I would have between 30 and 50 students every year that would be doing a year-long capstone program with me building a software project for a company. And in December, before they'd all go home for the break, I, my wife and I would invite them into our home and we'd have just a big party. And it was just a great opportunity to get to know them a little better. Here's some pictures. You can see all their shoes and, and uh, eating, playing games. Of course, they usually ended up in the basement or in the, out in the garage playing Nintendo 64, little Super Smash Bros. And that was a lot of fun. Uh, and of course, eating. Well, there was one particular individual. We called him Squats. He was a really bright, really nice guy, but his pastime was going to the gym and working out, and he did squats all the time, and his thighs showed it. And squats was a lot of fun. He came to this party, and, and, uh, and my wife and I were super busy. She was upstairs with the food. I was downstairs playing ping pong with, with uh, students. And in January, he came to me and said, hey, can we go get lunch? I'm thinking about doing a PhD in computer science. I'd love to have a conversation, get your advice. I said, sure, yeah, let's talk about that. And so I went, I said, sure, I'll buy you lunch. If you're thinking about doing a PhD, that's awesome. We get there, and the first thing he says is, I lied. I don't want to talk about computer science. I want to talk about girls. <laughs> girls? <laughs> I know what's on his mind, okay. Uh, yeah, let's talk about girls. He said, when I was in your home, I saw you and your wife, and I saw something I've never seen before. I saw a marriage that was strong, that was good. You were still married said, I can't think of a single couple, my parents, my friend's parents, I can't think of a single couple that's stuck together and is still married. What's your secret, was his question. What's your secret? And I told him, I said, Squats, I don't think you want to know, because I had shared about Jesus with him in the past briefly, and he said, don't talk to me about that. So I thought, you sure you want to know? He said, yeah, I want to know. So I told him, my secret is in God's word. It's what Jesus has done in my life, and I see direction in the Bible that tells me how to live, how to have a great marriage, and I follow that. I try my best. My wife and I both do. He's like, you're right, I don't wanna know. But I wanna know. He said, I wanna have a great marriage someday. So yeah, tell me more about it. So I believe I have a great marriage, and it's not perfect marriage, but it's a great marriage, and I believe it's because my wife and I both love the Lord, and we have bought into this. We have chosen. We don't want to conform to the ways of the world. We want to follow what God says in his word. And here, this is kind of small, hard to read, but this is just a sampling of what that instruction looks like, what it means to not conform to this world. So in that same verse, or chapter, Romans chapter 12, it, talks, it continues to explain what does it look like to not conform to this world. It says, love must be sincere. Hate what is evil, cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. This isn't just talking about marriage, by the way. This is in general, how we live, how we treat each other, to love each other, be devoted to one another in love, in the dorms, uh, wherever you go, in the classroom. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor, serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. These are just practical things that God tells us through his word that we should, this is how we could live. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. In other words, let him do it. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will, keep, you will keep burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. This is just a sampling of what is in the Bible. There's so much more of what it means to live in a biblical way, in a way that follow, follows God, that does not conform to this world. I think about how God gave the law in the Old Testament to the children of Israel. Um, to his people, and he, he did this in order for them to just know, how am I supposed to live? What's right? What's wrong? 
they were not exactly sure. And so he simply established, here's the law. And, you know, it starts with the Ten Commandments, and there's much more to it. You can see all of that there. They needed that definition. In a way, I was, as I was preparing for this, I thought about our lifestyle covenant. In a way, that's what we're doing at Tabor, is we're giving you this lifestyle covenant, covenant saying, this is how to live. We think this is what's best for you and best for our community, and in fact, best for all people in all communities because it's grounded in God's word. It's kind of like that law that helps you know what's right and what's wrong. And I recognize that for some people who haven't lived that way, that this is totally new, it's like, that's hard, that's different. That is a new way of living. And I understand that that might be challenging for some, but we're confident that it's best. The great news is, that Jesus came to fulfill that law. We don't live under the old law of the, of the New Testament. My wife helped me find this. She reads a lot more than I do in this book by Brennan Manning. It says, Jesus liberated his disciples from the tyranny of the law. He did this not by abolishing or changing the law, but, be, but by dethroning it from its pr place of primacy, relativizing it, making it subordinate to love and compassion, to the law of the Spirit. That's what Jesus did for us. And so we have this new command for Je from Jesus that makes it so much easier than following all these meticulous rules of the law. It says in John 13, 34 and 35, a new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one one another. The basic idea there is Jesus came and said, if you have genuine true love that I can help you have, be filled with, and pour out to others, and I'm going to give you my Holy Spirit to do that. If you have genuine pure love, you're going to naturally abide by the law. It's going to be easy. And I think that you would find that with our lifestyle covenant as well, that if you have Jesus in you and you are following him and trusting him, you don't even think about the lifestyle covenant. That's just the way you live. It's good. It's right. It's natural. It makes sense. So as we wrap up, I want to invite you to lean in. Lean in to a new way of living. I encourage you to take serious the opportunity that you have at Tabor to come to chapel, to lean in, to come anticipating and eager to see, what does God have for me? What am, I, what am I to learn? How am I to grow and change? What's this new way of living? And, and think seriously, is that what I want? Do I want that new way of living? And I hope that you will be attracted to that. You'll say, that is right. It is good. It's what I want. Teach me more. And it's not just chapel, as you know. There's classes, there's people all around. I think what you're going to find is there's a lot of wonderful people in the Tabor community with great marriages and who love the Lord and who are eager to pour into you. Lean into them. Ask them questions. Have lunch with them. Connect with them. Matthew 7, 13 and 14. I encourage you to enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. And like this, Matthew 16, 24 to 26, my last slide. Then Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must de deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? This is my invitation to you, is to figure out what does that mean? To lose my life, I'll gain it? It's a beautiful, beautiful insight once you understand it. I believe it's right. I believe it's best for you. So join me in losing your life in order to gain it through Christ. Thank you for coming to chapel today. I look forward to seeing you at future chapels on campus. May God bless you richly. I want to pray for you real quickly, and then you'll go out. Dear Heavenly Father, may your will be done in this place. Be with each and every one who's here. Go with them. Give them strength. I pray that your Holy Spirit would draw every one of us into you, that we would learn to trust you fully. God. 
Keep us safe as we go out. Fill us with love and peace and joy. And I pray that we, we would learn this new way of living that is obedient to you and it would be good. In Jesus' name, amen.